are we all doing today? Well, listen, I'm from Los Angeles, but this is getting close. This weather's getting better. So thank you for that. And thank you to Gustavo for that very gracious and generous introduction. It's nice to be here with all of you today. You know, normally I, sh I show up at events to talk about innovation, startup nations, scale up, as was just uh, appropriately referenced, uh, the SBA is known for our SBIR, the Small Business and Innovation Research Programs, where we direct percentages of every department's budget to small business innovation. So if you don't know about our SBIRs, we're the largest seed fund in the world. If you don't know about our SBICs, it's a great tool for those of you that are in private equity, mezzanine, or early stage. Uh, what we do there is we leverage up. So if you raise $50 million with our uh, bonding, you get $150 million to be able to invest in small businesses. So becoming an SBIC licensed is also a terrific opportunity. But I pivot today. And I want to recognize the summit's entire advisory council for making this gathering possible today. I want to recognize the people at Wharton, Knowledge at Wharton, and the Lauder Institute for sponsoring today's event. And to Susan Siegel at the Council of the Americas, thank you for being here, for her important leadership on all matters Cuba. Finally, to Fakire Diaz for the work that happens every day at Tres Mares to create opportunities for those who would otherwise go without. Big hand to all of them. Come on, let's be generous today. Thank you. Thank you. After pursuing a Cuba policy that failed to achieve its stated objective for half a century, the United States last December broke from our past and looked to the future. A week before Christmas, President Obama announced that he was instructing Secretary Kerry to begin discussions to reestablish diplomatic relations with Cuba. Secretary Kerry, as you all know, is now leading negotiations that will result in the opening of embassies in Washington and Havana for the first time since 1961. This will provide a direct platform to assist in trade negotiations and export opportunities for Amer American businesses. America and Cuba, as we know, are separated by only 90 miles of water, but were brought together by 2 million Cuban Americans and 11 million Cubans who share similar hopes for a more positive and promising future for the Cuban people and their nation. We have an opportunity here to strengthen Cuban civil society and to build a climate for entrepreneurial growth. Let's show the world what we are for. We're for free markets. We're for strong democracies. We're for global efforts to protect the planet and its people. While I know that uh, you understand the importance of normalization, we have to seize this opportunity. It's our chance to strengthen the region and to create greater opportunities for both parties. As you heard this morning already, the departments of the Treasury and of Commerce completed their rulemakings and issued revised regulations in January. Today, some of those possibilities for increased engagement will be highlighted regarding Cuba. But even with these changes, we are realists in this room, and we know that most transactions, most imports and exports between the United States and Cuba remain prohibited. So it's an important reminder to carefully review the Commerce and Treasury regulations to ensure that your planned activities involving Cuba are authorized. But the regulations do, they do do some important things, make some important changes. You may now organize trade missions to Cuba to learn firsthand about opportunities for enhanced trade and private sector development. We've removed limits on remittances that support humanitarian projects and the emerging Cuban private sector. We've authorized certain telecommunications exports to enable Cuba, uh, Cubans to communicate with the outside world. Our US Ambassador for International Communications and Information Policy and I recently visited Danny Sepulveda. He's just returned from Havana last week. He met with the Cuban Vice Minister of Communications and they discussed how Cuba can expand the internet across the island. Social media companies that use every day, 
social media companies have already traveled to Cuba to explore opportunities. The US financial institutions are now allowed to open correspondent accounts at Cuban financial institutions to facilitate the processing of authorized transactions. Of course, we all know that lifting the embargo does take an act of Congress in a literal sense in this instance. And the President has been clear that he looks forward to engaging Congress in a full, honest, and unabridged serious debate about doing so. When a policy fails for more than 50 years, we believe it's time to try something new. So here's the bottom line. The administration is committed to empowering the Cuban people to become less dependent on only the island's state-driven economy. We're replacing isolation with engagement. This is the best way to improve Cuban lives and support our own national interests. The Cuban people are extraordinary, and so are the opportunities that lie ahead for them. Cuba has a highly educated workforce. This is just one of the qualities that make this country an, an attractive candidate for entrepreneurial growth. This is an ideal time to think about supporting the development of small businesses through microfinance. The regulations also permit educational training related to entrepreneurship, business, civil education, agriculture, journalism, organizing adult literacy, and even vocational skills. These activities are all available and permissive now. So the message to the US business community today is, don't wait on the embassies to open. If the Cuban government continues to drag its feet, this will go on for a really long while. Don't wait on the US government to organize the formal US trade visits. We've always known that in the end, we can rely on ourselves. The B2B, the business to business engagement can be the best remedy. So we're looking to our business community to lead in this instance. I hope your presence here today means that you are ready to take action, to engage, and to lead. Governor Cuomo and Governor McAuliffe have already announced plans to lead trade delegations to Cuba this year. So will the American Chamber of Commerce. The US government has relaxed rules on travel, banking, remittances, insurance, licensing, and exports. Included in the new rules is latitude for you to play a more proactive role to improving life conditions and economic opportunities for the Cuban people. To support their independent economic activity, to strengthen civil society. And by the way, this is not, not I don't mean to in, uh, imply that this is a one-way street. A couple of years ago, the Castro government liberalized rules for Cubans to start businesses on the island. As a consequence, we've seen that hundreds of thousands of residents took their first foray into capitalism. There are currently 201 industries and occupations that are approved by the Cuban American, excuse me, by the Cuban government, where entrepreneurism and self-employment are specifically authorized. They run the gamut from real estate broker to food wholesalers and retailers to telecom giants, agents I mean, to B2B operators, to auto body repair. The Cuban government is also seeking foreign investments in areas such as agriculture, infrastructure, building renovation, and real estate development. We already see countries making an impact like Spain by helping to help run a state-run hotel industry. Other Latin American and European countries are conducting mutual benefit commerce on the island as well. While the new regulations generally do not authorize US, in Cuba, US investment in Cuba as Americans, one of the most important things we can export to Cuba, and this is where you come in, right now is our business acumen, our experience, our sense of capitalism. There aren't too many MBAs in Cuba there aren't extensive business education programs or entrepreneurial training programs. You can work with your local chambers to identify these opportunities for mentorship. You can identify Cuban SME partners for your supply chains and initiate a dialogue today. 
you can transmit even a fraction of expertise in this room to Cuba's budding entrepreneurial sector, the returns to us could be immeasurable. President Obama calls entrepreneurship the most powerful force the world has ever known for lifting people out of poverty. In my travels around the world, more recently to Marrakesh and Milan, I've seen how leaders around the developing world have come to see this truth behind the power of those words. Entrepreneurship is no longer considered the job you take because you have to as a last resort. It's the job you take because it affords incredible opportunities to make a profit and to make a difference. From the Far East to the Middle East, from the Sub-Saharan Africa to Latin America, citizens understand that entrepreneurship is the path to lasting change and hope for a better future. That's been the story of my life. I was born in Guadalajara, Jalisco, Mexico. Try to say that. And my story has been one that we expect and hope will happen in Cuba over and over. I immigrated at the age of five, and my mother worked in a very small poultry uh, plant where I saw her fingers stiffen and her legs thicken as she processed this poultry. But my grandma would always write to us and say, if you bring others along, someday, someday, a reward, you'll see a reward in your life. And I finally wrote to her and said, I just became the third grade milk monitor. And she said, remember, it's not the titles you have. It's what you do with the titles that you have. And so indeed, although my family for some time had been a, our history had been one of migrant workers, my grandmother assured me that through entrepreneurship, I could change the arc of my life and that someday I might be able to work in an office and even be a secretary. The good Lord heard her and allowed me to hold office and to be a cabinet secretary. But that is the point of social mobility, that I could have been somewhere else and been able to navigate through a corporation, exercise my stock options, and build a family bank, and then go into public office and transform the state of California with new connected systems around our infrastructure. And then to get a call from the President of the United States to serve on his cabinet, to spur our nation forward, to assure that we have an entrepreneurial spirit in the millennials, in our encore entrepreneurs, in all of people. That is what we want to do for the Cuban people. So it is our values that we want to instill in the Cuban people more than anything else. This is what we want to export. As we talk about agriculture, what are we really talking about when we reference environmental standards and labor standards? We're talking about exporting American values so that we can preserve ours. We're inextricably connected. So these are the things, although I didn't speak the word of English, and I certainly didn't speak the language of business, somehow, through mentors, through other people, I was able to navigate. That is what we must think about and consider for the Cuban people. Uh, last month, I, I mentioned that I was in, uh, in Milan, and one of the ministers, the minister from uh, Panama, Ada Romero, uh, said, to, by the way, she's hosting the summit next week uh, here in, uh, in the Americas, but she stressed that after 25 years of democracy in her country, inequality still persists. She said that entrepreneurship is the single greatest force that they have to make progress. It's the single force they have to empower women and their youth. But before we export our products again, we must export the values. The business to business dialogue that you can lead today is how we can take that very first big step it's how we can begin to stamp out tyranny and ultimately provide greater security and stability in the region. No one can know exactly what the future will look like in Cuba. No matter what we do here, none of us really knows what the future will hold or how quickly change will come. But you can play a role now and we can hasten this progress by forging B2B businesses, B2B relationships and partnerships today. History has shown that once the economic fates of nations are inextricably linked, conflict, conflict gives way to cooperation. A French economist once said, when goods don't cross borders, soldiers will. 
Thomas Friedman put it a little differently in the Lexus and in the olive tree in 1999. You remember his famous hypothesis, countries that both have McDonald's don't go to war with one another. Trade creates international goodwill. It humanizes your adversaries. I can recall when I was in the beverage business that the Soviet Union, that we discussed how the Soviet Union allowed Coca-Cola to be sold behind the Iron Curtain. And many believe today that Coca-Cola helped bring the curtain down, that Coca-Cola helped to build humanitarian relationships. But we know, what we do know about Coca-Cola today is that uh, in Cuba, we all know that they call rum and a Coke. What do they call it? It's called Cuba Libre, meaning free Cuba. Nothing will bring about a free Cuba faster than you, our business leaders starting that cross-border engagement. Today, together, let us renew our leadership in the Americas by cutting down the loose and anchor the past to reach a better future for our national interests and the American people. Take this opportunity to be a force for change in Cuba, a force for good. I'll close by reciting a quote from a gentleman named Ramphis Castro. And no, he's not related to the Castros. He's a budding fellow at the Kaufman Foundation. He said, starting business is human nature. The desire to prosper from trade has existed since antiquity. Holding back this instinct forever is impossible. It's like stopping rain. Eventually it falls and things begin to grow. To Wharton, our investors, American exporters, and our chamber officials and community leaders who are here today, it's time for us to plant those seeds for the betterment, again, of the Cuban people as well as our own. I want to thank you for my story, but now we want to replicate that story over and over again. I still remember as a young person remembering John F. Kennedy's quote, and he said, in America, we don't all have equal talent, but in America, we should be given an equal opportunity to develop our talent. Don't we want that for other nations? Let us come together, embrace one another, because together we can do anything. We can continue to grow prosperity around the world and assure that America continues to be the de democratic leader around the world. Thank you for your leadership. God bless you and God bless the United States of America. Thank you.